Welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshana B'mitzvotah V'tzivan Al-Asok B'divrei Torah And may our May the merit of the study of Torah be acceptable before God. May it be delightful in his eyes and may it be delightful in our eyes as well and your eyes. And may it help bring about a time when the divine sovereignty can be established in this world in a way that will bring people together that we recognize how we're all from one source and it's our responsibility to try to be loving and kind. So let's go into the screen share and look at the text. So as you see, we're just at the end of the first day, Yom Echad, day one. Amar Rabbi Yochanan said Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan was a great, great rabbi. If you study Talmud especially, you will see his name mentioned many, many times. And uh, I believe he was very much involved in the authorship of the Tar Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, uh, that is as opposed to the Babylonian Talmud. So the reason it's called the Babylonian Talmud is because it, for the most part, represents discussions in the academies in Babylonia, and the Jerusalem Talmud represents uh, the discussions of the Jewish community in, uh, well, I guess I would have to call it Palestine, because that's what the Romans called it at the time. So it did not have the political nationalistic significance that it does now. So I just don't want to be try to avoid misinforming people. So this is what Rabbi Yochanan said. Gadol yom kibbutz galuyot, that the day of the ingathering of the exiles will be as great ke yom shenivru bo shamayim ba'aretz, on the day that the heavens and the earth were created. Think about that, right? The day of the ingathering of the exiles Right, so he's speaking at a time, of course, where the Jewish people have already been, many of them have been thrown into exile by the Romans, and um, to, thinking ahead to a time that is a fulfillment of many prophecies about the day when God gathers the scattered Jewish people from the four corners of the world and brings them back to the land of Israel. And he'll, he says it's as great as the day when the heavens and the earth were created. How does he know this? Here's the proof. Shinemar, as it states, and this is from the prophet Hosea chapter 2, and the children of Judah will be gathered, etc. The Gomer, the Samulahem Roshechad, and they shall place for themselves one head, one chief. And they shall go up from the land, in other words, to return to the land of Israel. Uchtiv, so that's one place, Uchtiv, and another place it says, There was evening and there was morning one day. Now, this is from the tractate Psachim in the Babylonian Talmud uh, on page 88, side one of the page. And there's the there's the proof, right? The proof it says is it seems, right, on the surface, that because it says Rosh Echad, that it uses the word Echad here, and it uses the word Echad here with Vahi Vekar Yom Boker Yom Echad, that that's proof. That's proof of the significance of the equivalence, right, of the day of the ingathering of the exiles and the creation of the world. And we'll see what the Torah Tlima has to say about this. Because if you are a little bit shocked by that and a little bit puzzled by that, you're not alone. You're in good company. So, Lama Gimel. Let's take a look at Lama Gimel. Here we are. He says, it isn't clear at all the whole issue of the comparison that's being made here. And if we're just simply saying that it's based on the equivalence or the comparison of these two words, in other words, the fact that you've got echad in the one verse and echad in another verse, he says, for sure, it's tough. It's tough to understand. 
What does the one have to do with the other? So, of course, he's a rabbi. So my dad, my father of blessed memory taught me that the definition of a rabbinic question is that you already have the answer. So let's see what he says. And it would appear that it comes to clarify that the intention is uh, or he's saying, maybe he's saying, it's worth it's worth clarifying. The ein hakavana that the intention is not rock rosh echad that it that they have one head yelahem the two law and no other heads. In other words, when Hosea says they will appoint a head for themselves, it doesn't mean only one head. That's not what it means. So the two and more nothing. because that's really not going to happen. That can't happen. It can't happen. Ki kinahug bechel tzava, because as is seen from the practice of armies, right, these soldiers of an army, mitchalkim hatzava lachalakim ulemachanot, that the army is actually divided into different parts, right, and different camps, right? There are brigades, there are um, uh, smaller divisions, there are divisions, etc. An army is subdivided. And to every division and camp, Rosh Umanhig, they have a leader and a commander, right? We know about uh, generals, and then we have five star generals, we have generals on a lesser level, we have majors, we have captains, we have lieutenants, we have corporals. We have sergeants, right? I mean, it has to be divided. And these are all leadership positions within the organization of an army in that example. Yeah, and, and why? Because because if you just got one, one commander, lo speak, he's not going to be able, he's not capable of sustaining all the operations of one of this huge army. One person alone isn't capable of doing it. It's impossible. But Omnam, and in fact, indeed, la hasarim umanigim to such uh, we would say princes and commanders, yesh rosh echad, okay, uh, that there is one head, right? Shenishna shenishma imheim lemashma ato. In other, or he has certain heads, I suspect, he says, that are subject to his command. <laughs> right? There's a chain of command. And in fact, the value that he has, what we would call him would be the Sar Hasarim, the Prince of Princes, Gavoha Me'al Gavoha, the Supreme Commander. That's what we'd call him. Vezehu, and this is the point, Sha'amar, right, that was stated in what we just quoted up above, the Erech Sar Hasarim, and that is the uh that is the value or the meaning when we say Sar Hasarim, right? That he has Gavoham al Gavoh. Sorry, I'm competing. Vezehu Shamar, Damash, forgive me. And this is reference to Damash Katub. This is exactly what is meant. Not that they only have one head, period, but when it says they shall appoint for themselves one head, love dafka, it doesn't exactly mean one and only one, dafka echad mamash, only one, but in fact there would be this head and uh, and the first of all the other princes or officers, etc., Right? We're talking about that. That's what it means by Echad. Umevi Ra'aya, and the proof he's bringing, the Lashon Echad, that this term Echad, right, one, a no more al Echad Mamash, it doesn't always imply just only one, okay? Rak al Echad, okay? So, sorry, I'm reading this incorrectly. Forgive me. Eino more al echad mamash, rak al echad When it when it is talking about one, 
actually, I think I was doing this correctly, that it isn't just talking about a single one, but what it's talking about is echad meyuchad. It's talking about a distinguished one, one that's distinguished. Milashon shebekan yom echad. And why does he say that? Because here, in the counting off of the days, it uses the term echad. It turns the term one, day one. Because obviously what it's referring to is the first day. In other words, the question is becoming, why does the Torah choose to use a cardinal number for the first day and not an ordinal number? Why doesn't it say first day? Why does it say day one? Because in all the other days, it says Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, it does use ordinal numbers. Because it doesn't make sense, right, to say day one. Because the fact is that the days of creation were seven. Ella, Ella, but the real the, the, the real deal is, right? The real point is that all those seven days of creation, they're actually the first. All each one of those seven days is the first of of all of the days of the of the world of the universe right i mean there's creation going on the point is that there are these seven stages and each one of those days is the first day in that particular stage umimela and automatically you can conclude have yom harishon shebebria so then you conclude that the first day of creation Rishon la Rishonim. You'd have to call it that it is the first of all those first days. For Hutziu Hakatov and the and scripture showed its exceptional quality Echad by using the term Echad. So that's that's what Rabbi Yochanan is actually pointing out in making this comparison to Rosh Echad, which doesn't mean just one, okay, but has this special meaning, which in a sense we already saw in the fact that it said Yom Echad in the in Genesis, in chapter one of Genesis. The Kahu Biur Halashon Rosh Echad. And this is what we need to understand when the by the term Rosh Echad one head. The Al Derech Sachot and in a clear and bright way, Ha'inyan Omer, that the that this uh Ha'inyan, right? I think it's gonna say, Omer, he's saying, De Yom Kibbutz Galuyot, that the day of the ingathering of the exiles, Ye Be'erch Dulat Hayom, okay, that is gonna have the value, right? of the greatness of the day when the heavens and earth were created. In other words, when the universe itself came into existence. Sorry, Lauren, do you want to do you want to comment now or do you want me to finish off well, these little it's about the word, use of the word Rosh, so you can decide. Okay, okay go ahead. But, it's fine. Um explained Echad as yes. opposed to Rishon. Yes. But it didn't explain the use of Rosh, and I think Rishon's related to Rosh. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. What are, but what are they referring to when they use the word Rosh? That is here? going to be answered in a moment. Okay. Um, and then if you have a further question, please feel free to follow up. Right. Here we go. Ki kamo oto hayom, because just as on that very day, the briat haya rishon la rishonim, that that first day was the beginning of all those first days, so the head who will be chosen on the day of the ingathering of the exiles, he is going to be the head of all heads, the first of all the firsts. And we are doa, and we can figure this out, that that head that's being referred to in Hosea, Ka'e Amelach HaMashiach. That is actually referring to the 
anointed king, in other words, the Messiah. Okay, so now we know what that bush is in Hosea. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Lauren, but that's that's the point he's making. Well, so, yes, they're saying, it sounds like they're saying the Mashiach will be appointed on the very day of the ingathering instead of he's already there and bringing it about. Well, he'll be identified. People will, I think what Hosea is saying is people will identify him. So if he's there already, which I think is sort of, you know, is suggested by other passages, but the point is at that moment, they will, he will be elected. The Messiah, I will say, will be recognized and accepted, etc. You know, uh, I think the point about it is this is the significance of saying that we crown God king on Rosh Hashanah. Is God king of the universe regardless? Yes. But the acceptance of the divine rule and, uh, and the divine creator as being our, you know, sovereign is up to us, right? That's what we bring to it. And likewise, so on this day, when the Messiah comes, all right, to, speaking in those kind of terms, actually refers to the willingness on the part of humanity to accept divine, a divine authority. And that's what makes it as great as the day of creation, because, you know, it's so interesting that after all these years and after all these centuries and after all these millennia, we are still down to Cain and Abel. Still down to Cain and Abel. Hasn't changed. And so the idea of the coming of the Messiah is saying that on that day, the world is going to be a different world because people aren't going to need to do some of the terrible things and commit the terrible crimes that they're committing right now. Whether on a small level or on an international level, it's so sad. You know, uh, I don't think I shared with you that I reflected on the description of World War I as the war to end all wars. Remember, they described World War I as the war, war to end all wars, which is perhaps one of the greatest examples of irony that you could pick, because how many years later did World War II take place? But I realized that the difference between World War I and all previous wars was the degree of destruction that took place. And I think the reason, perhaps, and I could be wrong, that it was called the war to end all wars was that people would realize and be so horrified and so shocked by the level of destruction that took place in World War I, that they wouldn't want to fight anymore, that it would be a deterrent. And I note that in the Civil War, or the American War of the States, tens of thousands of soldiers died in the battles. But in World War I, the factor was 10 times as much. There were hundreds of thousands of people who died in the various battles that took place in World War I was absolutely horrendous. And of course, we don't remember much about it anymore. So who knows? And I invite comments if you'd like to. Well, I mean, I understand what you're saying, that they're saying people should have been horrified, but it's not human nature. It's human nature to feel angry and hurt when there's been violence and and you know people take sides and right. and it just i mean all it does is bring about of course more reasons to fight and more wars and right. and that should have been clear even back then right so germany world war ii wasn't necessarily i don't think the first war after world war one it was just the first huge war first you know huge you know well, certainly it was, in a sense, a repetition, right? Because what happened was Germany was essentially humiliated. You know, the Treaty of Versailles penalized Germany and made them want to pay for the war. But wasn't there humiliation and repar reparations that led to World War I um, that was not Germany but France? 
I don't recollect that honestly. I don't. I at least in the book that I read about World War One, there was a different attitude about warfare back then. And what had happened was, you know, the the European countries and England had colonized this, the African countries and other areas of the world, and because they had such a an advantage of armaments, they just were just you know totally dominating and making colonialism possible. And somehow they then thought, well, maybe we should try it on one another. But uh, I mean, I'm giving a poor representation of some years ago that I read the book, uh, but- uh, And that's yeah. just one stream, yeah, but not the only yeah. stream of- no, I'm not sure. I remember what happened was, of course, it was the murder of the of the Archduke, wasn't it? That sort of threw everything into- That's a catalyst, yeah. That was the catalyst. Yeah. No, the the murder the murder of the archduke, yeah, uh, of the uh, that was a catalyst, yeah, it was, not because it was actually a very insignificant event, relatively speak, relatively speaking. I mean, the murder of anyone is a terrible thing, but but it's was, yeah, you it know, was, but yes. nationalism and and all that on the rise, and people yeah. digging into separate of factions, course. and <clears throat> and our guy was killed, and you know, and jealousies, yeah. Said. Yeah, yeah. Well, you talk about Cain and Abel and the oh, biblical, yeah. you know, brotherly rivals and cousinly rivals and all that. It's all, you know, a lot about jealousy and especially Joseph. It's very clear, but not only, <clears throat> not only Joseph, but you know, it's it's very it's, sad. It's really very, very. It's sad. human nature for people to dig into sides and to and to want to be aggressive if they feel slighted and and to let their you know hostilities go unchecked. And war provides a way to do that. You know, to to do it so so called legally. You know, and it used to be they used to try to contain it by saying, "Well, you you have to have all this method to." legally declare war and they've kind of gotten away from that it's like well if the war is happening then it's a it's a war that needed to happen it didn't you know but it so as far as bringing about peace i mean this is just human nature run rampant when human nature is no longer running rampant it probably would have to be divine intervention well, we could say almost anything in some senses is. So if you'll allow me to make the, the when you say human nature, it is one part of human nature. It has to do with allowing one's emotions to control one's behavior, as opposed to the Buddhist uh, concept of being mindful, which is such a, I think, such a well-expressed concept that when when you allow yourself to be mindful, then what you do is you think about the consequences of the behavior. You don't just react on your emotional reaction. And that to some extent, in other words, you, you either have a conversation or you, you listen. You, your human beings are capable of that as well. Part of, it's part capable, of but, but that's doing what doesn't come naturally. That's of, rising above of, nature. Of course, of course. But as human beings, we have that capability. Yes, you're right. You're right. But and, it's not, and it's, not everybody uh, does have that capability, unfortunately. Oh, and it's easy for the people who don't have that capability to accomplish these, you know, giant and and you know acts of aggression that just lead from one to another to another to another to another. To another. Lots of aggression and destruction destruction and hostility and and you know those people don't seem to have breaks well we may we may have to disagree over this in that uh while i understand that there are those people who simply do not have perhaps the mental acuity for this they generally aren't in positions necessarily of power unless they've been put in those positions by people who really could know better. Your uh, mental that, acuity, yes. Emotional acuity, people with emotion without emotional acuity are often in power. Okay. I'm not, I, I simply won't argue with you about that, okay? But what I do want to say is I really believe, you know, uh, it's something I've said recently a lot of times. An explanation isn't an excuse, right? And so 
you could one can say, well, it's human nature, but that's not an excuse. The fact is that part of human nature is our ability to be reasonable and to think through things and to seek and to think out the consequences of one's behavior and not be uh, enslaved to one's emotions. Okay, I mean, the fact is that there are all the resources here in this world to prevent people from behaving this way. But in, on, a, on a certain level, I do think, and perhaps we are in agreement here, that there has to be a desire, which would be an emotion to for decency, but it has to be allied to being mindful. In other words, you have to want to be mindful. There has to be something inside of but, you. But the, fact, but the fact that many people don't want to, and those pe those are often the people in power, because yeah. their desire is more about short-term gains for themselves, and that means power, it means money, it, it means all kinds of things. But they're, they do things to take power. They do things to stir up the divide and conquer. Yes. You know, they're smart. They're not, you know, they're not emotionally healthy. <laughs> but... Yes, they they tend to, you know, run things, they tend to cause a lot of trouble. Yes. And it's, as I said, you, you can have rational, peaceful people who are putting down, you know, an agreeable set of um, negotiations that both sides can agree on. And it only takes a couple of these people who want to divide and conquer and, and, and somehow maintain their power to easily just like you know, push it one domino down. Yes, I hear you. And I don't totally disagree with you. I, I get it. I mean, I think that's, that's perhaps a place for prayer, you know, and, and, and uh, for, for the, dis, you know, for knowing the discipline that we try to go through. But I think there is definitely room for prayer. And to some extent, I feel that, you know, God, God is a player in all of this. Uh, you know, I, right now we're at the end of our, almost at the end of our lesson. Look, I think there's absolutely a place for adversity in this world, but on the level that it's taking place as far as warfare, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, we, we have these statements, you know, that one nation shall not lift up sword against another nation, et cetera, you know, and those sorts of things. So I guess I can pray for it, pray for such a time. I can't have false expectations. And, and of course, to a great extent, I have to agree with you but, in, but, on many levels. But I do think it's possible. Enid, I mean, Enid um, Pearl and her daughter, Tasha Kaminsky, are standing outside uh, Corina every Shabbos singing Lo Yusa Goy and, and these Jewish prayers of peace. We're yeah. inside the added prayers to the services, and there are two <laughs> of them are very one-sided yes. and can be seen as inflammatory by the other side. Yeah. And this is, you know, uh, in the name of, of holiness and prayer and a response to events. And I think that most synagogues, not all synagogues, the prayers that have been added to the service in response to current events can be seen as one side and possibly inflammatory by the other side who's, you know, it's digging sides. It's not, you know, where is something like, you know, most of the peaceful um, scripture and low use going and all that, it doesn't do that. It's just talking about peace for humanity, not, you know, just may our side prevail and may our side, you know, be saved and may our side this and may our side that. Yeah. Uh, I like the way they're doing it. Yeah. Um, Enid and Tasha. Yes, it's obviously, you know, the simple response to that is it's complicated. It, it, are there such a thing as people who are wicked, who are incredibly wicked? Yeah. And, and, and they, on both sides. Yeah, I understand. But where's the major influence of these people? You know, I there's no doubt. Uh, and of course, it's now eight o'clock. Degradation and frustration in some cases, uh, will for um control in other cases it they play with each other very easily yeah. again i think what you're bringing out is the complexity of trying to be fair about this and uh i you know i appreciate 
hearing what you have to say. But I don't believe that fairness and peace and goodwill exist in a universal enough way in this life. I think it would have to be divine intervention. I don't think we can. Yeah, I think you're right, though. I think I, I, have a, I, I do agree with you there. But then on some levels, I feel that there is divine inter intervention going on on a constant level. And that the area of choice that we have is there. It's limited, but it is there. It is there. Otherwise, there's no responsibility for human behavior. And I do believe that we are accountable. So I, you know, no, I don't have a lot to argue with you about it. It's a question of trying to clarify and be truthful about these things. And I know you are you know, doing everything you can. And we're not going into it now, but there's a lot of room for debate about whether people do have free choice. Lots of room. And we're yeah. not going to, it's okay. another well, subject to go so, into. Right, true. But, okay. but you can't take yeah. it for granted is all I'm saying. No, no, not at all. I'm going to stop the share and we'll stop the recording.